We all know that passage where the Buddha tells Rahula at the very beginning of his meditation to make his mind like earth. He's basically teaching patience, equanimity. But then he applies it to instructions on breath meditation. And his instructions on breath meditation are not just be patient with the breath, be equanimous about the breath. You actively take an interest in the breath. So when he's saying to be like earth, it's not like being a cloud of dirt that just sits there. He's basically telling to make the mind solid. So when good or bad things come up, you're not swayed, you're not pushed off, knocked out of line. Because you want to understand these things. After all, the duty with regard to stress or suffering, dukkha, is to comprehend it. So you don't just sit there with the dukkha, you're trying to understand it. So it's a combination of solidity and curiosity that the Buddha is teaching here. The solidity gives you ballast and reminds you that as you're exploring, sometimes as you experiment, you can't just say, well, I'll experiment with this particular idea, this particular perception for a few breaths, and if it doesn't work, I'll throw it away and try something else. You have to stick with things to see what results they have over the long term. Because sometimes it takes the mind a while to warm up to an idea, or it takes a while for the breath to respond, or the body as a whole to respond to whatever perception you're applying. So you need that kind of ballast and a willingness to sit with things. Again, you're not just passively enduring. You're actively doing something, and you're going to stick with it until you can be really sure that you know what the results are. And this may take time. So it's an active form of patience that the Buddha is teaching. But then aside from that, he's also asking you to be inquisitive, ask questions. Like those instructions on breath meditation, the 16 steps, there's so much that's not explained. Here it is, the one technique that the Buddha explained in most detail. And still there's a lot that you have to figure out. He talks about calming bod bodily fabrication. How do you do that skillfully? If you try to stifle the breath, it's not going to work. John Lee gives some good recommendations. Think about the breath energy as having channels that go through the body. Think of the channels all opening up and connecting together. And you find that as you think of the body in those ways, hold that perception in mind, gradually things do begin to connect, and the breath does become calmer. And then think of the breath moving through the body faster than you think it ordinarily does. I know some people say they try to breathe in, and before they've even got the breath down to the stomach, they already feel the need to breathe out. Well, that's one perception you might have about the breath, but there are other layers of breath that have already gone down to the stomach and gone down to the feet, just as you begin to breathe in. Just like the ocean has currents on many different levels that travel at different speeds, the breath energy in the body travels at different speeds. So think of a really quick breath energy. As soon as you start breathing in, it's already gone all the way. Because after all, the breath is already there. It's not as if when you breathe out, you've squeezed all the breath out of the body. Now you've got to fill it back up again. What goes out is just a little bit of excess. But if you breathe out and stop, there's still breath energy in the body. As the breath starts coming in, it simply infiltrates the breath energy that's already there. Hold that perception in mind. It makes it easier for the breath energies to work through the body. And then as the breath energies get comfortable, the Buddha talks about allowing the, yourself to breathe in a way that's sensitive to rapture, breathe in a way that's sensitive to pleasure. 
pleasure and the rapture can flow quickly and fill the whole body. But notice the Buddha puts these instructions only in a very spare outline form. It's up to us to try to figure out what he means and then how to make use of what he said. That's going to require our curiosity. Because after all, he says a lot of things that are counterintuitive. We suffer because we cling, and clinging is like feeding. We think feeding is a good thing. It's our number one attachment. They say that during the World War II, when people were in concentration camps, the men segregated from the women. Men got tired of talking about sex very quickly, and the food, however, became an overwhelming conversation topic. They never got tired of that one. So here the Buddha is saying that the way we feed is making us suffer. In fact, the need to feed in and of itself is his paradigm for suffering. So we have to figure out, what does he mean? Why? And why would that be suffering? He sets out the Four Noble Truths not simply as a, a nice thing to think about. He's challenging you. Each one of the truths is a, is a challenge. Your cravings are making you suffer. And we think that our cravings are what enable us to find happiness. He says it is possible to put an end to craving. You know, we've been with craving for who knows how long. It's what brought us here, and so it's going to carry us on if we don't put it into it. And the Eightfold Noble Path will put an end to it. How does that work? That's what the meditation is all about, developing the qualities in the mind that can counteract the craving. And there's some paradoxes there. One of the factors of the path, of course, is right effort, and right effort involves desire. So you're going to use some of your desires to overcome your other desires before you finally turn on the desires of the path itself. So there are paradoxes, there are questions. He's trying to make you think. He wants to make you inquisitive. Ask questions, and primarily ask questions about your own mind. When the mind is thinking in ways that drive you crazy. Why is it doing that? We develop concentration so we can put the mind in a place where we can look at the mind. When we think about the mind as a committee, we're trying to train the members that are the investigators, the watchmen, so you can watch what's going on in the rest of the mind and try to figure it out. The Buddha doesn't want to st simply accept the truth of his teachings and say, oh yes, it's true. There is suffering. Suffering is the clinging and the craving. There's the clinging that's caused by the craving. And when he says that one of the ways we cling is to our sense of self, so yes, we accept the fact that yes, our self, that sense of self is a problem. But that's all very abstract. And if we don't challenge ourselves and challenge the teachings to figure out, well, how could this be true? We're never going to be able to get down to the details, because it's in the details. Specific perceptions, specific, specific ways of thinking that are causing us to suffer. If we don't get down to those details, we just stay with the generalities. It's not going to have much of an effect. When a particular unskillful thought comes up in the mind, what is the particular trigger? What is the particular allure of that thought? You have to be quick to see these things. They're like the subliminal messages on TV. They're there right before your eyes, but they're so quick that you miss them. So we slow things down by staying with the breath. Gets, we can actually see these things that are operating on the surface. We're speeding up our refresh rate. Think of it that way. It's like listening to bird songs. 
Some birds have a squawk that sounds like they're hitting several notes all at once. Actually, they're singing arpeggios, but it's just that they're singing them so quickly that human ears can't stay, stay up with them. Our refresh rate is too slow. It's the same with the mind. A lot of things go on. They all seem to go on at the same time. We glom them all together. But when you get the mind really still, it's as if your refresh rate goes faster. Everything else outside seems to slow down. And you can begin to detect steps in the process by which you pick up an idea, run with it. Change it as you run with it. That's the kind of thing you want to see. So you want to have patience and endurance, but not for the sake of just putting up with things or accepting things and being content with things. You endure so that you can understand. You want to watch what's going on. After all, what could be more fascinating than the way in which the mind creates suffering for itself? trying to take an interest in that. We spend so much of our lives trying to rearrange things outside, demanding that things be like this, be like that, thinking that when our demands are met, we're satisfied. No, they're not satisfied. So we think, well, maybe it was the wrong demand, or maybe we're not demanding enough. But really, the real issue is inside. So we take our fascination with the outside world and direct it to the inside world. That's when things can open up inside. And so this mystery of why it is that we want happiness but the things we do create suffering can be solved. So the endurance to sit with it and the curiosity to want to figure it out, confident that it can be figured out. That's what the Buddha's message is all about. He figured it out, and he gives us some pointers on how we can figure out our own problems. The large outlines are the same. The details are going to be individual. Remember when I was staying with Jean Fu, and after a couple of years I suggested to him that he write a guide to breath meditation because he had so many details you couldn't find in the John Lee books. And he said, well, John Lee covered all the, the main themes. My argument was, well, there, a lot of the little details are where the things really open up. And he said, that's going to be an individual matter. That's where you use your ingenuity, that's where your curiosity has to be focused. Because the suffering is in the details, and the solution is in the details. The purpose of the Dharma, as the Buddha set it out, is to point your attention at the right spots and to get you to start asking the right questions. I think it was a famous author once said, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, it doesn't matter what answers you come up with. But if someone like the Buddha gets you answering the right questions, then there are right answers, and they really will make a difference. <laughs>